We made it 13 weeks through the book of Revelation. I don't know about you, but I feel like the book of Revelation has really challenged me in some really important ways. I feel like my relationship with God has grown. Uh, my trust in who He is has deepened, and I have been convicted about how to live my life as a follower of Christ here in our present day and age. How has the book of Revelation encouraged you? What is the Holy Spirit stirring in your life? I hope as you're in your final groups uh, through the study of Revelation, you can spend some time answering that question, question. What is God doing in your life? How has this book changed you, challenged you, comforted you, encouraged you? Uh, really take some time and listen to one another. Uh, and don't leave uh, this study um, without spending some time to reflect on what God has taught you over the past several weeks. So in our final uh, teaching time to today, we're going to look and hear from Nancy Guthrie on the final chapter of the new heavens and the new earth in the final chapter of Revelation, Revelation 22. I hope you enjoy her teaching. A Christian life in which we simply orient our lives around the teaching and example of Jesus with no real expectation of his bodily return to this earth, that's not the Christian life at all. The orientation of a Christian is leaning forward in anticipation of the next big event in redemptive history the second coming of Jesus Christ. Believing that Jesus is going to return to this earth may seem foolish to most people in the world, but it isn't foolish. Based on what we have read in the whole of the Bible, including what we have been shown in the book of Revelation, to live in expectation of the second coming of Jesus is the wisest way to live. Because this truth is the most reliable truth in the universe. That's what the angel said to John after he wrote down the visions that make up the book of Revelation. Look with me in Revelation 22, 6. He said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. My friends, the day is never going to come when you will regret believing all that John has written in this book. You won't regret believing that this is the way human history will progress and come to its culmination. Remember how this content came to John? It originated with God himself. It was given to Jesus, who gave it to his angel, who gave it to John, who wrote it down for the church and for us. You can put your trust in the reliability of what you read in the book of Revelation. And as you put your trust in it and live in light of it, you will experience the promise inherent in it, which is blessedness. So, let's begin working our way through this epilogue all of the way along in this book. We've been tracing the promise of blessing in Revelation. And here in these final verses, we find the same promise of blessing we read in the first chapter. Look in verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. All the way along this study, we've been asking what it's going to mean, what it's going to look like to hear and keep the words of the prophecy of the book. And as this book comes to a close, the question before us is, will we allow our lives to be changed by the images we've seen, by the declarations we've heard? Will the reality of the coming Jesus in judgment and salvation shape our priorities 
our concerns, our finances, the way we use our time and energy, the way we speak about Christ to others and the way we speak to ourselves about what is real and what is reliable. As we think through the ground that we have covered in these 22 chapters, we've seen that there is tangible and profound blessing to be experienced now and into eternity by those who, one, have their vision of Jesus Christ shaped by Revelation's vision of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished, what he will accomplish in his second coming. Those who are willing to evaluate their churches and themselves in light of the commendations and criticisms of the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. There's blessing for those who allow the heavenly worship of God portrayed in Revelation 4 and 5 to guide their own worship. There's blessing for those who persevere in their bold allegiance to Christ and witness for Christ even when it costs them. There's blessing for those who see through the false veneer into the true ugliness and evil of this world's systems and philosophies and priorities. There's blessing for those who rest in God's providence, believing that God has the power to bring about everything that he has pictured and promised in this book. There's blessing for those who expect that the wicked will experience judgment from God and that we will actually celebrate his justice and righteousness. There's blessing for those who orient their lives toward the new creation, refusing to expect that life lived under this current order will ever truly satisfy or sustain them. And finally, there's blessing for those who anticipate seeing their Savior face to face and enjoying communion with Him for all eternity. Oh, how I hope that this study of Revelation has been about so much more than nailing down how to interpret it. You see, the goal is to live it, to obey it. The goal is patient endurance. The goal is to overcome this world's pull toward compromise and apathy and idolatry. The goal is to one day be clothed in the white robes of Christ's righteousness, to hear our names read from the Lamb's book of life, to be sealed and sanctified and saved. Thank you so much for being a part of a life group this fall. Life groups are places where we, uh, as individuals here at Trinity, we come together in community and follow and respond to Jesus. The Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. It's not meant to be uh, this isolated experience, but it's meant to be uh, lived and worked out in community, in groups, around tables, studying the scriptures, listening to the person of Christ, responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and hearing each other's stories along the way, doing all of that together. And so our life groups are going to take a break. Our midweek life groups will take a break for the Christmas season. We're going to pick back up in January, January 10th and 11th. We're going to be going through a series on the fruit of the Spirit and looking at the ways that we are called as Christians to be conformed to the likeness of Christ and to see the difference that that makes in each one of our lives. So I encourage you to be a part of that, to invite uh, friends, family members, maybe other people at Trinity who aren't part of a group into your life group. Make some room at the table for people to experience the goodness of following Jesus together. So I look forward to seeing you uh, next year I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and we'll see you soon.